Breaking the wall of radicalization. How security studies explore the roots of terror. Peter Neumann, King's College, London. On November the 9th, 1989, I was a high school student in Würzburg, watching the events unfold on television. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to be here, and I'm going to talk about one of the questions that I have been asked as long as I have studied this subject, which is also the most difficult to answer. Why and how do people become terrorists? And I'm not promising to break any walls today, but I do think we have made a lot of progress. How to become a terrorist is essentially what has motivated me to delve into these topics. There are three things that most people who are working in this area agree on. And they seem a bit bland at first sight, but they are actually more profound than you think they are. The first one is that pretty consistently, every empirical study that has been carried out of people who have become involved in violent extremism have found that psychopathology is not a significant cause of people embracing this kind of tactic. And as much as we like to consider what terrorists do crazy, it does not necessarily mean that the people who are doing it are actually crazy. The second, perhaps bland but important finding, is that radicalization is a process. No one becomes a terrorist overnight. No one goes to bed like all of us and wakes up with a suicide vest around their waist. It is a process that consists of many steps that often unfold over the course of months, in some cases years, and it is often little steps, so that the last act is not going from zero to 100, but perhaps only going from 98 to 100, which isn't that much. And the third important thing that we know and that we all agree on is that there is no single pathway all these macro theories about terrorism are almost entirely wrong. Terrorists aren't all poor, they aren't all uneducated, they aren't all educated, and they aren't all rich. The holy grail, the simple formula that people are seeking to discover, perhaps is undiscoverable because it doesn't exist. So what have I and my team done over the past few years and what makes me so confident that we can break walls in this area? What's new is, first of all, bad news. The bad news is that over the past five years, we have seen an unprecedented mobilization of people who are considered to be violent extremists. Over the past five years, according to most of the serious estimates that are around, up to 30,000 people have gone from 100 different countries around the world to participate and fight in the Syrian civil war, typically as part of so-called jihadist groups. And we've also seen, and this is of particular interest to me, that a striking number, about a sixth of all of these 30,000 people, around 5,000 people, have come from Western Europe. These were people that have come from the midst of our societies and who have, for one reason or another, decided to go to a country that in the vast majority of cases they have never been to, to participate in a war that I would say in most cases they don't understand. Yet they have decided to do that, and understanding why, have, why they have done that is part, part of what motivates me. What's also new is that this conflict that has happened over the past five years is one of, is perhaps the most mediated conflict in the history of the world. And that's, of course, largely to do with the internet which is not only used by mainstream media organizations, but in fact has been used by most of those 5,000 who have gone. They have shared with us their experiences, their ideas, and some of their comments on what is happening. They have posted pictures, videos. It was possible, perhaps for the first time in the history of this, to follow a conflict in real time from a great distance. And this has generated, literally, millions of pieces of communication that me and my colleagues have collected. And what this has led to is that perhaps 
better than ever before, we can actually capture what has been going on in that conflict, and in particular with the individuals who have participated in that conflict. In 2012, my PhD student, who is on the left here of that picture, discovered that young British Muslims were going to Syria to fight. And we realized that once they were over there, they continued using the internet and were posting online diaries on social media. We discovered soon that it wasn't just that handful of people, it was actually hundreds of people who were doing that. We started building a database where we captured, by now, 750 Western individuals who have gone to Syria, on each of which we tried to collect 80 data points. We've also used sophisticated software called Palantir to make sense of their connections. We've also uh, tried to communicate, and we've succeeded in 150 cases of those 750 with those people on the battlefronts. We've communicated with them via WhatsApp, uh, other messenger services, Skype, and of course, we've also done what good social scientists should always do. We've actually gone there. We've gone to the border region, and we've actually met face to face with some of the people that we observed from afar. I personally believe that this combination of quantitative methods and very traditional social science methods, qualitative methods interview, is what gives us such a comprehensive insight. Now, what have we found out? And this gets to the center of what I want to talk about. I will not be able to explain to you the entire process in detail. What I want to highlight are three themes that have come out of our research very, very strongly. And the first theme or narrative is what we call defense against existential threat. This is something that is not very complicated. I've been teaching courses on homegrown radicalization at my university, at King's, at King's College London, but also at Georgetown University over the past five or six years. And often my students come to the class because they're genuinely puzzled by what motivates terrorists. And I often begin by asking them these very simple questions. Would you defend your family? Think about it. Would you defend your family? Would you defend your nation? A lot of my students actually agree with the idea of defending their family or even defending their nation. Next question is, how far would you go? Would you prepare to kill other people in order to defend what you consider to be your people? Would you, prepare, would you be prepared to die for the people you're seeking to defend? These are questions that when people consider themselves, they are often answering with yes. And it is not altogether different with terrorists, because often the narrative of defense against existential threat is a very important narrative that is being used in order to convince people to use violence against others. In the beginning, in the early days of the Syrian conflict, you had a lot of so-called radical preachers articulating exactly that narrative. Here is one example of hundreds I could give you. Think of a child that was killed. Imagine that's your child, the girl your sister, the woman your mother. The old shake your father, feel their pain, their wounds, their fear. The believers are your brothers, says the Holy Quran. Does this brotherhood not have any practical meaning? This is not complicated theology. This is very basic, and this narrative of defense exists in every culture, in every religion, and it is what is being used in order to appeal to people to participate. If the Karajaman, for example, is someone one of the 750 that we studied and one of the first that we actually discovered, he told us that at first, in 2012, he was reluctant to go. He said, everyone said this is a civil war amongst Muslims. We didn't want to have anything to do with that. But as he was listening to these speeches, and as on Twitter and social networks, the news feed was filled with atrocities against what he believed to be his people, he concluded the Muslims were being slaughtered I had to do something, and it prompted him to go. And this is indeed the narrative that, in a very powerful and arguably empowering way, is also being articulated in a lot of ISIS videos. Vous 
Pour nous tout vaut bien vaut, vie nous rien de sacré, votre sang coulera pour vos crimes odieux. So defense against ex existential threat is an important narrative that is being used. But this connects also to a second theme, which is very, very important in a lot of the stories that we heard about. And this is around identity and belonging, or rather, the feeling that people do not belong to the societies that they live in. One of my colleagues from Singapore once argued that the essence of extremism is a massive identity reduction exercise. Extremists, whether they are left-wing or right-wing, whether they are religious or ideological, want you to do one thing. They want you to see the world in black and white terms. They want you to perceive yourself in just one marker of identity and judge everyone else according to that marker. And this is what we see happening in the case of Daesh or the so-called Islamic State. What we've also seen in the case of Al-Qaeda, they are saying to people, you cannot be Muslim and European at the same time. You have to decide. And if you are a Muslim, then you cannot be European and you have to fight against Europe. The same goes for America and for every other country. Here is Anwar Laki, one of the most influential radical preachers that was a member of Al-Qaeda. For Muslims in America, I have this to say. How can your conscience allow you to live in peaceful coexistence with a nation that is responsible for the tyranny and crimes committed against your own brothers and sisters. How can you have your loyalty to a government that is leading the war against Islam and Muslims? And this is a story that we don't see just with Americans. We see that with Europeans from all over. This is an example of a 20-year-old Frenchman from the suburbs of Paris 21 years old, not stupid, but who realizes that the French Republican project, which is inclusivist in nature, doesn't actually apply to him. That this is not a society he belongs to, that it is, this is not a society that he feels comfortable in or that he thinks he will ever succeed in. And he sees these pictures on Facebook. He looks at them and what does he see? He sees young men just like himself, who are experiencing adventure, community, who have orientation, who are part of the society in which they truly belong and which they have a lot of opportunities. They are part of an exciting project and they can go from zero to hero in practically no time. This is a weirdly empowering thing for a lot of people who believe that they do not belong. And indeed, that's what we've seen in the case of a lot of people who have gone, the seekers. They are saying, they are English, Bosnians, Somalis, Japanese, even Chinese. We are the Euro Disney of the Mujahideen. When he injured himself and had to spend time in the dorm recovering, he was trying to recruit people over the internet, saying, we offer slaves, pizza, and martyrdom. These are typical stories of which we can present you hundreds of, and the story is always the same. It is ultimately about identity and belonging. Because I only have two minutes left, very quickly to the third thing that I believe is very important that we discovered, which is people. When you look across Europe and you're looking where these people are coming from, you always find clusters. In Britain, for example, in Portsmouth, Cardiff, Brighton, in Germany, in Solingen, Dienstland, and Wolfsburg, these are clusters of people and it's not an accident that they are clusters of people. They are clusters of people because these people have known each other for a very long time. Here's an example from one of the members of the Wolfsburg cell, Ibrahim B, who said, they were not random people that I went with, they were my oldest friends, school friends. It used to be that everyone had a particular haircut, downloaded Pushlido, that's a German rapper, to the cell phone, then you were part of the group. 2014, we all grew beards, dressed differently, went to religious meetings, that's what we did, and if you did it, you were part of the group. He essentially went to Syria because he was part of a clique. And some of the people had gone and he followed because he wanted to be with the people that he considered to be the most important people in his life, his friends. We know that because they documented the entire journey on the internet and we captured everything. We know where they met every night. We know whenever someone actually went to Syria. And with our software, we were actually able to understand the dynamics 
of some of these clusters that have emerged. This is an example of a Swedish cluster where people are actually basically all either friends or are in fact relatives. In conclusion, what does this mean and why does it matter? It matters because it, even though it's not a perfect theory, it's not even really a model, it gives us the first ideas on what needs to be done in order to counter this. It is important to counter jihadist narratives, not only with words, but also with action. It is important to strengthen traditional social bonds, the influence of family and non-extremist friends. And the most important thing is to create inclusive identities. If there's one story from almost all of these instances of terrorism and radicalization into extremism, it is that people radicalize because they felt excluded. And on this day, I think this is more important than ever to keep in mind. Societies that accept and include are by and large more successful than societies who don't. Thank you.